Congratulations to AAIB and to yourself uh, on the award of the International Banker CEO of the Year, Middle East. Well done. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank Great you, pleasure. Simon. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, this is a distinguished award and coming from uh, a very reputable institution and I would very much cherish it. And of course, despite this being personal, I would like to assure you that nothing of this would have happened without the team at Arab African who have done a brilliant and marvelous job. And again, I would like to thank you and thank the organizers for having me awarded this and on a personal level. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank Many you. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Now, 32 years with AAIB, that's a long time. Uh, but tell me, how did your career in banking actually start? Well, you're right, it's a lifetime journey. I started the right out of school into Arab Africa International Bank, where at the time uh, I was not really sure if banking is my thing. And since then I've been focusing, and since I started liking banking and liking what I do, then I started focusing and I've been now 32 years heading the bank after all these years. After all that time. But did that working your way through the bank, do you think that's helped you in terms of understanding both the bank and the people and the services and the products? Is that, has that background and that knowledge helped you? Of course it has helped, but more important, I've been able at the time uh, to uh, have uh, extensive on-job training with big houses like, some of them are not there anymore, but Merrill Lynch, and Payne Weber, and Drexel, and uh, UBS, which is still there. So I've had on-job training there, and I've also worked a couple of years in Manhattan and one year here in London. And uh, this being said, it's uh, helped me a lot uh, since I understood the international financial markets yeah. from my exposure abroad. And of course, I did know the local markets and Arab African from in inside out. So you, you worked your way to the top. What were the biggest challenges you faced when you took over the helm? There are several challenges because at that stage, Arab African International Bank was uh, a very uh, relatively small bank in terms of market share. It was less than half a percent of market share, now it's around five. And uh, it was only seven branches network and very few employees. And when I took over, my age was around in the late 30s. Average age was around 57, so it was not easy at all to 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 turn this around. Of course, I you know, I, I had to really focus and choose a good team to be in, in, to be able to uh, make this uh, come true. So, in terms of managing it, um, building a team around you that could move it forward was was that one of the ways that you managed it? That's the most important. That's the core thing. The core thing is to manage and to, to, more important, I mean, I don't believe in parallel restructuring. Like, I don't believe, like, there are, in, in, uh, in a lot of institutions worldwide, when there is a mess, they, they try to uh, do a parallel structure, where the parallel structure is more flexible, have people who are paid better and work better and are more educated, and the old structure is left to fade away. I totally believe in total restructuring. So you have to get the people on board. Mm. And in order to get the people on board, you have to really make a statement and you have to really prove to them that things are doable and to lead them. Lead them first of all, of course, by example and lead them by informing them and by knowledge, which is very important uh, thing, uh, I believe. And in terms of leadership, what do you think it is that you have brought to that role? What, what are your leadership qualities that have helped you make that comprehensive change rather than doing something in parallel? The most important thing is that you have to believe that you can, to a big extent, change the culture and the attitude of people. But it's one of the most difficult things in the world. Because as you know, even uh, worldwide, when there, is, uh, there are M&As, most of them fail because of the culture differences. So addressing the culture and doing that in 
uh, a specific way to your institution is the most important thing to have people move. I just like to give you an example. When we first started, I just told you the average age was 57. Mm. And uh, I used to get new hires, very brilliant, very smart. And when they, they come, they would like stay in the institution for like uh, six months, seven months, and they leave. Then I decided to call them and ask, what's, what's going on? Especially that I know them uh, from, from uh, I, I teach at university, so I know them from, yeah. from university. They were my students. So I asked them, what's going on? So they say, more or less, the elders are demotivating us. And we are unable to even do anything or to even perform, and they are just not helping us. So I just kept thinking what to do with these for these guys. So I decided to establish a, a forum for the young, anybody who's in the bank up to one year where they can sit there. Because when you, when you let it individually, it becomes, they get, you get any kind of ideas. But they collectively have to come up with ideas that would make the workplace better for them or ideas to improve the work. And they have the right to call on me or any of the seniors of the bank to present what they want in a proper manner. And this has done wonders. They felt ownership. And they felt that they are part of the change. And, and, and we have been able after that to be one of, an employer of choice in Egypt. That was a significant change. You've had, uh, over the, the kind of last 10 years, you've moved from being a bank, really, to a financial group. How do you plan to continue the drive of growth in the future? The whole Middle East has a lot of potential in the banking for growth with different and varying degrees. Egypt, where is the home country and where the base is and the head office, we, we have uh, numerous opportunities. The, uh, the, the penetration of the banking sector is very low. The segments are not all banked. The SMEs are not uh, uh, well serviced. So there's a lot of potential retail, of course. We, we are very good in Egypt in the big ticket items, like the big corporates, big syndications, stuff like that. But when it comes to the middle market, we still need to, as a banking sector, to move forward and to, to, to cater for this. And, and that's your area for growth? You that's see. for area yeah. for growth locally. I do also believe that, the, since you mentioned the, the financial group, our investment arm is the area for growth, exponential growth in the region. Yeah. Because it is very hard to compete in traditional banking in our region of the world because banks are already competitive in their own markets. We've touched on um, the kind of challenge when you joined and, and how you started to incorporate new people into the existing structure, but you've had a lot of success. What are the operational challenges that come with success? So as you've achieved growth and you develop new markets and you develop new products, what are those operational demands on you and how do you deal with those? They are, I mean, they are extremely tough. And uh, unfortunately, I'm more of a business guy, so this makes it more tough for me. But I have to do it. It's, it's the job. And uh, yes, the challenges include, uh, of course, now we have these challenges spelled out and, and uh, like operation risk, market risk, and we've been strengthening this immensely in, uh, in the bank lately to cope and it's already been established with the, uh, and coping with the growth of the bank. Of course, most important also to have the policies and the procedures and an IT system that caters for the, with the control system that cater for the growth. Just touching on the kind of IT, there's a huge amount of attention being paid to, if you like, the difference between automating things and making things available online for customers. And, and the need for face-to-face. -face. Where are you in, in that journey of where do we put our effort, where do we focus? Is it, is it more the kind of systems that allow transactions quicker and easier for your customers, or is it actually maintaining the face-to-face -face service that customers often require? This is, a, this is a worldwide question and depends on the market and on the product. Of course, in retail, in retail uh, you, have to focus, you have to focus on IT and on internet. But when it comes to SMEs or high net worth, there is this personal touch. I do remember, I mean, uh, I mean you would as well, you're as old as I am, so you would remember that uh, when the ATMs first started, it was like, oh wow, what's going on? Now, without the ATMs, this would not have happened. Same would happen with internet banking. After a while, a lot of people it will help penetration, especially in a country like ours, where the internet penetration is way higher than the banking, and the mobile penetration 
mobile penetration in Egypt is above 100%, and banking is lower than 10%. So you see the yeah. huge opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's touch on um, how you calibrate your, your achievements. What do you think has been your greatest achievement since you took over as CEO? Of course, the, the performance of the bank and building the team and uh, having a sustainable story, not a blip. And that's one of the uh, things I totally believe in, sustainability. And what's close to my heart is being able to find, to establish the first NGO specifically targeting CSR and sustainability and uh, 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 development uh, of the society. And that's very close to my heart. And it was one of the reasons how I convinced the team to work more because I told them if you stay extra hours than your colleagues, know that part of this is going to the society back. So we're doing it on behalf of your behalf and we're doing it in a very good way. You are well known for um, the kind of CSR and sustainability programs that you run. Which, which is the one that for you um, resonates most personally, the one that you're most proud of? I'd just like to hear, just focus, because a lot of institutions do charity work, including in Egypt and worldwide, and CSR work. When we started coming from the banking, we, we know that we want to maximize return. I mean, this is at a given level of risk, so we want to maximize the return at a given level of donation. Mm -hmm. What happened practically that when we started first, we started before establishing the association as a kind of a normal donation to one of the hospitals. And when it was done, it was amazing. The, refurbishment, we had money well spent, and everything is fine, and I went there and I had my photos, everything is cool, mm -hmm. everything is great. And then, two months later, I decided to go and visit the place, because I want to see. And I find it going down very fast, because okay. there is no maintenance, because these, uh, I'm talking about public sector hospitals, they don't have the means, so whatever donation you give them, they take and they build, and then it goes under again. Mm -hmm. So we decided, and that's where, uh, coming back to the project, we decided to focus on health, health for kids, and education, the society, but that's mainly one of the, the, the focus. And focusing on health for kids, we wanted to focus on the sustainability of the project. So we now partner with these people. We partner them, we partner, and we, we do the, the, the the extra, they have the infrastructure, they have the, uh, the, uh, the, the place, but we partner in terms of getting even a cleaning company, security company, making it state of the art for the people. So, so I'm proud of so it. So it's, that, again, to that sustainable thing, it's not just about giving them cash, it's about working with them in a longer way, longer term. There has to be a mutual interest and partnership and checks and audits, and there has to be an involvement of our personnel of the association with Personnel, we do a committee with the head of the uh, hospital and personnel from our part, and they can manage even to the extent of getting involved but a higher level on the running operations of the uh, uh, Other than that, what happens, I don't know what happens here, but what happens is that the money goes for, a, 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 for instance, refurbishing, and, and, and then because there is no maintenance, six months later you find it. Yeah. Or the building is very nice, but then the nurses are not doing a good job. So we have to put all these dots together. If the nurses need training, we train them. If they need extra time, we pay them. If they, We just try to do the best. Yeah. And of course, what's important about this, it's again, another concept of banking, which is leveraging. We're leveraging the money that the government puts and that is not put to proper use because of just a little bit that you need to add, yes. which is little because they do have specific boundaries. We've managed to decrease the waiting list of uh, breast cancer in the public hospitals from two years to zero. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. And for kids with uh, brain, uh, water on brain, from two years to three months. So. Yeah. So measurable success in exactly. terms of creating that. Now, you know, touching on community and uh, the corporate social responsibility, Egypt's had a challenging and difficult time over the last several years. What, where do you see that going in terms of, of the impact that it's had on the financial sector specifically? Egypt, of course, had a challenging time and still has a challenging time. The challenges get different, but there are still challenges. And uh, that, as we are now, I believe, uh, generally in Egypt, I'm 
extremely optimistic. We do have uh, these challenges that are everybody's aware of. And I believe that our focus currently is to attract FDI and tourism back. And of course, this is dependent on the security in the country and the social stability. So hopefully, if this is done, I have no problem. The Egyptian economy is diversified. We have an informal sector that is as big as the formal sector. We have appetite for people to, uh, uh, because we're the biggest market in terms of populations, we have appetite for investment. I've seen people from all over the world tap dancing to find opportunities. And we did it and we'll do it again on the economic front. But we need to take care of the social aspect. And that's the challenge we're facing now. We have been very fortunate that one of the first sectors that was subject to reform in Egypt was the banking sector. We started this in the early 2000s and we have been able to do consolidating the banks almost 40% less in terms of numbers and bringing new uh, banks who are very competitive to take weak banks because uh, so the landscape is very competitive. The, the banking sector is very liquid. We've had very prudent provisioning policies and we've had very focused uh, central bank, which I'm proud. Uh, I've been serving with, with them as a board member for eight years, something I'm very proud of with a very good team. And we've been able to create a banking sector that is solid in the face of even the international financial crisis and all the recent challenges. So we're quite confident that our banking sector is, is quite the new challenges that we have to face is what I mentioned briefly in the beginning, which are relating to the ability to increase the penetration, to go to the uh, other sectors that are underbacked in terms of yeah. size and companies and all this stuff. Um, what do you expect the Egyptian banking sector itself uh, is going to do in terms of future development over the next few years? What other things do you think they need to focus on? I still believe that going to the SMEs, mortgage finance, uh, which is very important. We have almost negligible in terms of percentage mortgage finance, so that you can imagine what this would do. Yeah. And retail, This is the these are the areas where I think there are a lot of growth. You've mentioned SMEs, and um, with the rollout of increased SME services in conjunction with Tanmir, and the improved provision of SME funding through the IMC fund, do you have any additional plans to develop solutions for the SMEs over the next few years? You, you, you focus on them a couple of times. What are the, your specific plans around them? The way we, the way we want to handle this, because it's, it's, it's a totally the, the problem. When I, when I looked at it and, and saw other banks in Egypt doing the same example, the problem was that they get people who are trained to deal with big corporates and ask them to deal with middle or small corporates. So I don't think this is doable. It's a totally different set of minds, totally different animal. And you have to treat it in a different way. So the way we're starting is we're still in the very beginning. We're doing a fund specifically for okay. SMEs out of an investment company, which would help us both extend equity or we needed mezzanine debt mm -hmm. to these companies and understand them, and then we can have a system that we can replicate and grow with. So, it, so it's getting a working model that you can then... Exactly. Okay. exactly. Now, you also mentioned uh, the way that new banks have come into the market. How much consolidation do you expect to see in the African and Middle Eastern banking sector over the next few years? Well, the, the, the problem when you talk about Middle East and Africa is that it's really a very, very different market, extremely different markets. And the barriers to entry are extremely, extremely tough. Most countries, you cannot have a new license. And in most countries, there are no banks for sale. Yeah. And if it is for sale, it, you have to pay, it's like, a you lot. Have to, a lot. Yes. Yeah, in terms of multiple, I mean, yeah. it's in terms of multiples, banks in our region are at least twice the multiples anywhere else. So that big makes it very difficult to go into traditional consolidation. Mm -hmm. However, as I mentioned earlier, and this is one of the areas where uh, I, uh, we would like to focus on Arab African, you can go there and do through investment banking. 
do you think that's going to be the answer, the, the kind of investment banking model? Will that, that be one of the ways that you move forward? That's one of the ways that we will move forward. We already have a base for traditional banking in uh, the Emirates, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and uh, Lebanon. Uh, but going into other markets like Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, uh, Kuwait even, mm -hmm. I, I tell you honestly, even international banks, and you can go and ask whoever or just look in and, and search, they cannot compete in the retail in these markets. Mm. They, because the local banks are aggressive, they have learned the, all the banking. Banking is no rocket science. At the end of the day, we, we all know the, 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 the dimensions. So they, they, they can't compete. So, so better to compete in an area where you have an edge, where you can link countries together. That's where yes. your edge is. I'm just touching on, on the kind of, you know, there's, there's no kind of rocket science about it, and coming back to people. As you look at some of the things you've been talking about, how do you spot the new talent that's going to kind of feed the bank the, the resources and, the, and the, the thinking and the energy and the drive to make some of these, these things happen? How do, you, how do you nurture that talent? How do you bring that through? You have to be an employer of choice. That's number one. You have to pay people. Uh, uh, in a fair manner and reward them in a fair manner as much as you can because sometimes it gets very difficult to spot who did with at a specific time but mm -hmm. as much as you can and uh, uh, more important you have to develop them so we have for instance uh, starting from the entry level when we just have what we call uh, what we refer to as high flyers those are people that uh, uh, we put into a whole one year a program for rotation. The program is designed that they have, they go and they rotate in all the departments of the bank, everything. And at the same time, do have a theoretical overview of the banking sector. By the time they finish this year, and despite it's tough for them, I always tell them, consider this as your real education in life. Because if you don't do it, when you go and sit and be a manager, you will not understand this and this. When you're young, you can absorb. And then this makes, for me, understand those people, when they come, the weekend, I, I tend to uh, uh, spot like the, the best people of them after the, after on the theoretical part and the practical part to get the report, and then we start spotting them. Mm. How does that fit with your own kind of personal life philosophy in terms of, of leading and managing success. What, what do you think you bring to that part of the, uh, the operation? How do you spot those people? What is it that gives you that eye for them? As I mentioned, you, you, have, a, you have this program and at the end, people who do well and at the end, you sit with them and when you sit with them for 10 minutes, I believe with 32 years experience in banking. And it's not what they know, by the way, because people, people, people sometimes would misread that. It's not what they already know. It's their ability to learn. Yes. And their ability to think and hopefully, I mean, one of the trick things is to give them a way out of the box question and see how they react. The other thing is to give them a very tough mm. question and make them think what's the thinking process. So what we need is people who have the ability to learn. Nobody knows everything. Yeah. Now, we've been talking about um, quite a lot of kind of local issues and regional issues. How has the broader global banking sector, how does that impact on... AAIB. Whether AIB or the whole banking sector in Egypt, we're not depending on funding from abroad, which has been ex almost now stopped because of the situation. Mm -hmm. And other than the situation, or the challenging situation in Egypt and the downgrades we've had, mm -hmm. other than that, more important also the BIS ratios, which makes it uh, so hard. So the interbank market has already dried. But fortunately, and part of the uh, uh, of the banking se sector reform is that most banks are very liquid. So we do have liquidity. In fact, the banks in Egypt to date are a net uh, depositor to the whole world. Mm. They, they are not a net taker. Yeah. And in, in terms of kind of local sectors, um, what do you think uh, will affect the Egyptian economy the most over the next few years? The ability to get tourism back and FDI. Full stop. Yeah. These are the it's, two issues that we really, every Egyptian has to work on. Now, finally, looking to the future, what are the key factors that will affect the growth of AAIB going forward, do you think? I believe that uh, uh, on the local front, 
we will be focusing on the on increasing the penetration for retail and on the other sectors of the corporate market and on the investment banking side we were planning to go with this regional and to be able to expand our products and our services in the region in order to be uh, one of the leading financial groups in the region. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, for your time today. It's been thank a you. pleasure. Thank you very much.